Well, episode three of the Bridge of Doubt podcast, um, and we couldn't be more stoked to bring you today's guest, Nick. Um, welcome, and thank, thank you. you so much for coming on board. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's good awesome. to be here. It's been, it's been a big year um, for you, and you've had some huge success um, just speaking behind the scenes in the back half of the year. Um, can we give the viewers and um, the listeners a bit of a rundown yep. of what you specialize in? Yeah, so I'm a financial planner, so what that means is basically... I deal with people's finances, superannuation, insurance, um, investment portfolios, self-managed super funds, uh, retirement planning, et cetera, et cetera, yep. budgeting, cash flow. Um, yeah, it's pretty broad, really. Yeah, nice. Um, awesome, yeah. So what um, we really like to dive in as deep as we can, yep. and we like to go from the start. What was life like yeah, well, back in the day? Back in the day. Back in the day. It feels like a long time ago. <laughs> I don't have a great memory on it, but so I guess you mean so from like five, six, that type of yeah, man. I mean, yeah. I mean, key key aspects of your life mm. um, where it all where where life kind of started for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like most of my childhood memories grow up around a cul-de-sac where I just spent pretty much every day outside after school, coming home. My mum wouldn't see me from about. I don't know, when he finished school, about three o'clock yeah. till dark. And she'd come out and have to like call out to me, like try to find me. I'd be off in the bushes, my mates and with bikes and yeah. stuff like that. So I guess that was, that's kind of like early child. And that was pretty much my life from, I don't know, from start of school, kindy, mm-hmm. all the way pretty much until year five, year six, just every day outside. You'd never find the me. Came Before the iPhone, I didn't, I like, I wasn't, I wasn't really that into computer games, even when they, well, video games, when they were coming out. Um, maybe I play a bit of Crash Bandicoot yeah. on PlayStation 1. <laughs> yeah, that's the entire population but, yeah. anyway. So. <laughs> but yeah, there was no iPhones. I didn't have Game, Balls or Game Boys or anything like that. Um, yeah. So, But yeah, most of the time was just spent outside, yeah, in the mud, in the dirt, oh, bikes, hurting yeah, myself, cool. climbing on construction sites. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you, you grew up on the coast? Yeah, Central Coast. So I grew up in initially for like that first childhood in Greenpoint. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but been on the Central Coast my entire life. Yeah, nice, nice. So grew up in surfing, obviously outdoors, yeah. bike surfing. Yeah, yeah. So like then. probably yeah, like um, you know, bike riding early childhood, and then yeah. probably from about the age of well, year six, got into some bodyboarding because it was like the easy way to get out into the water. Yeah, yeah. And then I kind of, I guess I transitioned to surfing, not necessarily because I wanted to do so I love bodyboarding but I think I kind of perceive surfing as oh that's like a step up that's yeah. like the cool thing to do cool girls might like that a little bit more yeah. <laughs> standing up instead yeah. of laying down always yeah. in the back of your mind yeah. always in the back that's of your it. mind yeah but yeah I grew up surfing I pretty much spent all my weekends I used to catch the bus down to the beach like every weekend just hang at the beach sometimes I like yeah skip school that type of thing go down the beach yeah <laughs> I can relate. I can yeah, relate. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Had a lot of ups a lot and days. Of people can. Yeah. Yeah. So, whereabouts did you go to school? Uh, into into high school. Yeah. So Central Coast Adventist School. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, spent kindy to year eleven. So I dropped out in year eleven. Yeah. Um, so I left for one term. Went to another school, Terrible High, for about one term. Um, that was just because I. But kind of background of me, I was always just like a very rebellious, um, don't like authority type person. <laughs> Not so much anymore. Yeah. There's a little bit of element of that still there. But for pretty much my entire childhood growing up, I just didn't like authority. Teachers, people telling me what to do, how to do it, what I have to do, how to learn, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So I got in a lot of trouble in, like, throughout school. <laughs> um, couldn't sit still, all that type of thing. I couldn't concentrate. Um, so I went to Terrell High just because I thought, oh, that's a bit more wild, a bit more like freedom. You can wear whatever, whatever shoes you want, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, pretty soon after being there for about a term, um, it was a little bit too wild. Yeah. So I was probably just thought, you know, actually it was heaps easier being back at the private school, Central Coast Adventist School. Um, so I came back there probably yeah. after about a term. Yeah, and you know, that was in year nine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so what, what about Terrigal was so... So tall. I mean, I've heard stories, oh, but yeah. give me a rundown. It was, it was just wild. I mean, from day one when I got there, I mean, I remember my first class walking in and you sit down, blah, 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 like looking around, like this is heaps of like, big dudes, wild dudes. Like it was crazy. And um, I remember the teacher walking in and straight up these girls are picking up chairs in the classroom, year nine, and throwing them across the, the classroom at each other and spitting on each other and just going crazy. And I'd never said, like I come from... Like the Central Coast Adventist School, obviously, like Christian school, that type of thing, like ethics, all that. Like, so it's very, like, you know, 
quiet and peaceful and everyone's like the kids there are probably a little bit more relaxed yeah. but over there these kids were just going crazy like there were some really nice kids i made a lot of good friends there as well but that first experience in that classroom where basically these kids were just and the teacher just walked out like i'm just gonna wait till you guys calm down yeah. it's just crazy like complete different it's, it's um, interesting, man, because all that you knew was the Adventist school yeah, yeah. and being the big rebel or yeah, the yeah, big yeah. like, oh, yeah. like I'm getting out of here, like something's better for yeah. me. And you go and you realise, it's like when you go to another country, well, you're like, I had no idea the world was like this. Yeah, it's I like, good going, wow. Like I was the good person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it kind of made me, I ended up, you know, probably doing a few worse things being there because then you're around even a worse environment mm -hmm. and a circle and then you start to do some worse things but yeah going there i was quickly realized like i'm definitely not the, yeah, <laughs> one of the bad one of the baddest person absolutely. people at that school so how are you academically shit yeah terrible terrible yeah. Um, which probably sounds bad being in my job now sure but but throughout school academically um it was not necessarily that i wasn't capable um but it was just that I never had a desire to want to learn. Sure. Well, not the way that they wanted to do it anyway. I think that's what I struggled with was that. That, that, that way of teaching. Yeah, you're just sitting in a classroom all day. Yeah. You know, now, it's fine now, like you sit in an office and focus and concentrate. But that, yeah. back then, like I had 100 times more the energy yeah. and nowhere near the amount of concentration. And all I wanted to do was go have fun, like yeah. sure. go play, have fun talk socialize like and the whole school thing is don't socialize don't talk in classroom don't talk for pretty much like six hours of the day while you're in your class yeah. and just talk when you're in lunch and recess and learn by this certain way yeah yeah, yeah. and i really struggled with that so I, I failed my way through pretty much my entire schooling i don't think there was one year where i ever really passed anything so yeah, right yeah. E even maths were you naturally good with numbers no terrible terrible so it, which is funny because being in where i am now sure yeah of is, course i'm great with numbers now yeah. so the, that was the thing was that it wasn't necessarily that I wasn't capable back then, but it's I didn't have the desire to learn mm -hmm. and no reason or purpose to learn. Sure. Like I didn't see the point in it. Yeah. For me, it was like, why? Like, why do I have to learn this now? Like, sure. what's what is it going to help me with in life type of thing? Um, and looking looking back at that, it's yeah. kind of a tricky question, but looking back at that now, yeah. why do you think that was? Do you think it's just a maturity thing or going through? I mean, you're forced... When you're in school, you force yeah. whatever class you're going mm. to and you force whatever the curriculum says and the yep. syllabus decides. Yes. And so obviously that is quite constricting. And even, even now, I'm sure, I mean, with my work, I will go into a day doing what I want to do, yep. not what I'm forced to do. Yep. So, so there's still levels of freedom even when you are out in the workforce yes. rather than here is the exact task that you have yes. to do, yep. do it within an hour period yes. and then leave and yeah. you don't get paid and, and all this kind of yes. stuff. So yeah. it's not like there's really any reward anyway, no. unless yeah. you're, unless you're, but what do you think, um, do you, can you pinpoint a reason why you really struggled in particular? Uh, for me, and it's been my, it was my biggest question in school and I always used to question the teachers and they hated it. Yeah. I, I'm like, why are we doing this? What's the purpose? Sure. That was my biggest thing that I struggled to learn was, I don't see a purpose behind this. You're teaching me trigonometry or whatever it is, <clears throat> I don't see how this is going to help me. Can you show me how this will help me? Yeah. And they'd often say, well, it might help you later on in life. Yeah. So there was no like, oh, it'll help you, you know, in, in your career later. But I'm like, but how? Like, so that was my biggest thing was purpose behind what I was learning mm -hmm. always made me struggle to learn. Like I was constantly struggling to concentrate and want to focus because I was, well, what's the point? I didn't see the point or the purpose behind it. Yeah. Um, and that was the biggest thing between now and then later on in the life was the purpose. Yeah. I think that's a massive thing behind when you're learning is what's your reason? What's your yeah, reason? Yeah. Intention absolutely. or this kind of... Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So that's the biggest thing. Absolutely. So um, uh, moving forward after school, yeah. you said you left in year 11. Yeah, so <clears throat> year 10 I was going to leave. Mm -hmm. I was very always trying to leave school. I Actually in year 9 I did leave yeah. like to go do a trade. Okay. I got an apprenticeship. I lasted three days and quit. Went back to school. So Again, I, it's you realise. Because I was just like, yeah, stuff school. Like, this is shit. You know, I want to go make some money. At least I get some money and have some fun and whatever, get out of this whole education thing. And I quickly I got an apprenticeship. I remember going to Monday, having to wake up at 5.30 in the morning. First time. I'd never woken up at 5.30 before. Like, this is like, you're... I thought I was like 15 years old. So like yeah. I'm used to sleeping in like to 10, 11 o'clock and all that type of thing. Yeah. Waking up 5.30, boss is like, yeah, you're going to meet me in my house at like 6. 
to go to start work at seven. We had to drive like an hour. I remember just like literally moping out of bed, like couldn't even concentrate. I thought it was the worst thing in the world. Sitting in his car, fell asleep, got yeah. there. I was just hanging out to eat all day. I was just hungry, yeah. like waiting for smoke. And then like, yeah, 15 minutes. Yeah. I just quickly realized like after my first day, like how hard work it, like how hard work is compared to school. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming home, you finished at three. I got home at four and I just crashed on the couch, fell asleep. Just yeah. didn't wake up the entire, like that was my first day of working life. Um, and three days after that, and, um, that's it, I'm going back to school. School's yeah. way easier. <laughs> yeah. School is great. So I, that was, and then I went to year 10. Then I was about to leave again because I thought, no, nah, I don't want to do another. Then I thought, no, nah, I'll do year 11 and 12. Um, so I started year 11 and that was kind of a glimpse into what year 12 was going to be like. Yeah. That's when I'm like, no, nah, okay, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, so. and was it, again, obviously not seeing the purpose, but what was, I guess when you're going into the year 11, you get sort of around the party scene that sort of kicks mm. off that whole party scene. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the rebellious attitude attitude mm. even grows and even yeah. towards like parents as well. Yeah, like yeah. you start to think, oh, well, you can't tell me what to do. What was your relationship like with your parents coming into that age? Yeah, so my relationship with my parents right like now and you know, for quite a while has been is fantastic. But... Probably my rebellious, real rebellious age started from year six. Okay. No, so I, I don't know, I was probably quite premature, but I, I had my first drink when I was in year six at a house party. <laughs> um, but yeah, it kind of started there, that whole drinking rebellious stage in school. Um, yeah, my relationship with my parents suffered massively. Like so, because my parents divorced when I was 12. Yeah, so I think I was just in year six when they divorced, um, which... I don't know. It's in my mind. I never viewed it as a real tough time in my life. And subconsciously. I, there's subconsciously, there's a lot of things I still think, yeah, that it was a tough time. Yeah. But I think I remembered more back was that oh, cause I had two younger sisters at the time, yeah. um, and seeing them cry and then my mum cry, and all that. Like it was more like, okay, I got to be there for you, yeah. type thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, but my relationship really struggled with my parents because I was just rebelling hard, drinking, wanting to party, like hanging out with girls, just like doing some really stupid things um yeah so it struggled i was constantly fighting with them constantly trying to ground me constantly escaping out my windows all that type of thing Mm. so yeah it was it was a tough time for relationship with family for sure so constantly having issues and um can you pinpoint was it the separation that caused that rebelling yeah that's interesting i've never really thought about it to be honest until now but it actually started around the exact same time yeah so year six I think it was, yeah, it was sometime in year six okay. they separated. But if you're around an environment and you have to put on these big boy pants to look after your family mm-hmm. as well, you, it's a draining process. You might you don't often want to be there as well, so you want to go. It's you want to get out of it. Always, and I always that, wanted to that, escape. That yeah. sounded like probably being your reason to mm. get out of it yeah. and take your mind off it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I always, I pretty much always never really wanted to hang around home. So I'd always just try and be out somewhere like all afternoon till night or I'd be out at a friend's place or at a girl's place or whatever I just constantly and then on the weekends I just want to be somewhere else like parties mates place mm-hmm. all that type of thing um, yeah because you just don't it's kind of a bit of a depressing environment sometimes yeah. that type yeah. of thing um, but it was funny because I kind of went back and forth between my two parents house houses um, so when they initially separated I was 12 and I was living with my mum saw, saw my dad every second weekend um, but I don't know if you guys can relate, but I don't, or other guys, but when you're at that, that age of 12, 13, I don't know when it kind of starts around that, but like you really start to crave like more male type influence mm. type of thing. So mm-hmm. when they separated, my initial reaction was, I want to, I want to be around my dad, not necessarily my mum. Yeah, right. But I was living with my mum. So I said, well, can I go and live with my dad yeah. like, and see you every second week? And she said, no, which another thing like that was like an authority thing. Like she says, no, I can't go and live with the parent. I'm like, why? Who are you to tell me what to do? Right, yeah. <laughs> so I ended up packing my bags anyway. That weekend I was going to go stay with him, but I packed my entire bag, just got over there, so I'm living with you. So that's it. So I lived with him for probably a few years in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, but then he kept getting stricter and stricter around my lifestyle, so then I ended up going back to my mum's. So I just swap and change between the two, depending on who was going to mm-hmm. let me have more freedom. Sure. I haven't experienced it, but does, does it in your mind if it ever crossed your mind it's like oh well I'm just going to live with who gives me the most freedom and yeah. then on the parent end mm. does it become a does it become a battle of who can give their child the most yeah yeah that's it was it was pretty much for me yeah it was who 
who's going to give me the most freedom? So who's going to let me go out at night? Who's going to let me drink? Who's going to help me have fun, basically, or let me have fun? Um, and then who's not? So I just constantly change between, like, you know, for example, I want to have my girlfriend over. Who, who's going to let me have, well, they weren't going to let me have, so I'm going to go live here. Because sure. they'll let me have my girlfriend over. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, type of yeah, thing. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it could, I, I don't, I don't know if they really battled it out too much about giving that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it certainly was, for me, was choosing yeah. based on the freedom type thing. Sure. Yeah. Were you an only child? No. So I've got, so back then I had two sisters. Mm-hmm. I've now got a little half brother as well. He's seven, cool. but that's obviously just a recent thing. But back then, yeah, I had two little sisters. Um, but then obviously when my dad remarried, okay. I got inter- got kind of m- blended in with two stepbrothers. Okay. Yeah. So um, what are we now? Family of seven, maybe. I think. Large family. Yeah, or six. Six. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, large how, family. <laughs> how old were were your sisters when um, your parents split? Mm. So I think. Natalie must have been 10 mm-hmm. or 9 probably about 9 and a half okay. I think Taylor was 5 right yeah younger yeah. sister how did they how did they handle oh it was hard for them sure. yeah especially for my younger sister Taylor she really struggled so they they struggled a lot with it I think I internalised a lot so and even for a long like I don't anymore there's sort of a little bit of things I internalised but I would often always internalise my emotions okay. shut them down be emotionless sure. yeah yeah, yeah. Sure. so I don't know if that's a guy thing or whatever but yeah like you experience something you're like no, I'm just gonna shut that down yeah. like pretend it's not there pretend everything's all good just keep and you just keep bottling yeah internalizing everything suppressing it yeah. where they didn't know the exact opposite I don't know if there's a girl thing or whatever but they just completely externalized all their emotions um, yeah they were crying a lot yeah. well it was really traumatizing for them yeah yeah, yeah. Sure, so sure. That was a tough time. Yeah, absolutely. And so when, obviously you say you internalize everything and then uh, maybe the outlet was in going out and partying, Mm. putting it in the back of your mind, having fun, getting drunk. Um, When did it, was there a time where where the partying and the the drinking and the rebelliousness really took off? Like maybe when you were 18, when you were actually allowed to go out? So it wasn't, to be honest, it wasn't really 18 because it was like, because of my circumstances changed when I was 18. Yeah. So my, it's funny because I didn't actually, my real rebellious, I, I don't know, I was really premature with my rebellion time. And I think it is because of that whole separation with my parents sparked that. But the most rebellious time period was probably year eight and year nine. Mm. I was doing a lot of drugs, drinking yeah. a lot, mm. doing all that. So it was very young for me. But I was also hanging around a lot of other people who were doing the same thing. Sure. And a lot of older people okay. who, were, who were 18, buying me alcohol, buying me cigarettes drugs doing all that type of thing mm. um so i spent a lot of time doing that stuff for year eight and year nine yeah, yeah. even a little bit into year 10 as well okay yeah so yeah. um but my circumstances changed very early when i was 18 19 yeah. so i didn't actually get to i did there was a massive yearning for it but it was kind of really cut short basically all of a sudden yeah, yeah. um yeah so that i'd say year yeah yeah year, year nine year 10 that was what, pretty uh, what made you level out so so it kind of started around year 10. I got a girlfriend. She was from a Christian church. Um, and so she, I kind of wanted to be more somebody that she would like. So I thought, well, maybe I need to stop that shit and then start tidying myself up a little bit. Yeah. Um, so that kind of started to make me stop. But there's still a lot of rebellious things about me. But I kind of stopped the alcohol, stopped the drugs a little bit, like all that type of thing. Still had a drink occasionally um but she she was good at kind of i guess being a bit of a catalyst to stopping those things Mm -hmm. kind of yeah but there was still a lot of me who didn't know what i was doing didn't know what i wanted to do with my life right um yeah still had issues with um yeah you know having a girlfriend and like you got all these hormones and all this stuff like Mm -hmm. it's just it's a tough time like Mm -hmm. (laughs) what were you doing at this point because you dropped out of year 11 yeah yeah so i met her in year 10 Yep. Dropped out in year 11. Yep. Yep. So I actually worked, um, after I dropped out of school, I worked one year in admin, mm-hmm. just like in admin work. Okay. Um, so I just thought, oh, like, whatever, I'll just get some admin work. Hated it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely hated it. Like, 17 years old, just couldn't stand being in an office. Imagine doing admin work. Oh, in, seven, in an office, five days a week, just typing emails, just mm-hmm. letters. It drove me nuts. Like, I, yeah. I got headaches. I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. And I... Yeah. So I quit and um, 
I, I think I quit and then I basically um, stopped working full stop. So I was just living off Centrelink, just surfing, yeah. doing nothing, um, just being a real big bum, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so... And then... It, what, so what happened was I, was, I stopped working and then... Um, so I was, was still with the current girlfriend at the time as well. So I was 18 years old at this point. And I was just starting to go with my mates and stuff. She didn't really like it though, so was, we clashed a lot. Because okay. like hitting the age of 18, um, all of a sudden all your mates who wanted to go out partying and all that stuff, type of thing. And I still had a girlfriend. And I already done a lot of that. But then I'm like, oh, I still want to hang out with the boys. So like, and, you know, I don't know, like you're having a girlfriend. It's like, oh, I don't want you to hang out with me and I'm jealous and all this stuff. And then I, you know, as an 18 year old, like it's, it's very difficult to have a girlfriend. In my personal opinion, I don't think you're probably quite, I don't know, emotionally ready to have a girlfriend maybe maybe you are maybe some are and that's fine but for me anyway I wasn't I was nowhere near ready um I just had too many things too many I was just like crazy and didn't know how to treat a girl didn't know how to respect them yeah. all that it's pretty much like I don't know it's whatever I just want to go do whatever I want and I don't care about you mm-hmm. so it's you know um it was kind of bad for her to have to go through that as well sure. um so that was something where I was just hanging out with mates drinking a lot blah blah blah, blah. but um so and, then, and eventually it got very frustrating the constant tension between us two and so i ended up just breaking up with her well, i'm done i don't want to deal with this anymore mm. yeah so and about two weeks later um after i broke up with her i get a phone call she's calling me up and i and and she was texting me for a while you know like you know when you break up i don't know if anyone else experienced you break up, and they, you, don't break up. You, you don't break up there's like still with this communication yeah. and i but i was playing the like don't talk to me don't talk to me thing and she was still wanting to like she was hurt like she was heartbroken it was horrible um, and where I was just like, I don't care, like whatever, I just want to move on my life and, yep. you know, go hang out with my girls and stuff. But she kept messaging me and I'm like, please stop talking to me, all this type of thing. Well, it was pretty harsh. Uh, but then again, like 18, you just don't, you just don't sure. think about other people's much, feelings. Yeah. yeah, you just, well, for me anyway, I just, Absolutely. you know. Um, but I get the phone call and I answer, I was like, what's up? She's like, I need to come see you. I'm like, oh, I was like, oh, really? I'm like, far out, like, what is it now? Like, what are you trying to get back with me or something? She's like, no, no, like, it's really important, I need to see you. So I'm thinking, okay, sure, like, come over. So she comes over and she looks quite, like, worried and scared. And I'm 18, just going, like, what's up? Like, why, why are you here? Like, what's going on? And um, she pulls out this stick, pregnancy test. And I'm going, I'm going, what's this? She's like, I'm pregnant. I just went, I was like, oh, fuck. Like, it's like, shit. I'm like, really? Like, you're pregnant? And I started laughing. My, that was my initial reaction. The first thing I did when I found out my oh, girlfriend was pregnant wow. or my ex-girlfriend um, was pregnant was I started just cracking up laughing. I was just like, I think because I was in shock. I was like, like, sure. what? Like, I was like, this is crazy. Like, what do you mean you're pregnant? Like, we're broken up and all this stuff. And I was just like, fuck, like, what? It was really like a moment like, holy shit. Sure. Like, yeah, yeah. 18. Like, you dudes are still finishing HSC at 18. I'm just like, I didn't have a job. Yeah. I didn't have any career i didn't have any future like whatever i didn't know what i was doing mm. and um she tells me she's pregnant and it was just a massive shock of what am i going to do what are her parents going to think because i was a really strict christian parents mm. they're going to kill me what are my parents going to think what are other people going to think like how am i going to do it? like it, for me too like it wasn't i guess kind of being raised in the background being christian everything too the whole thing of like abortion wasn't really a um something i really thought about um it's not something I necessarily have a, an opinion on either way, but it wasn't just, so for me, it was more just like, okay. And it's yeah. really that, like, girls being pregnant at your know, age has probably only really come about in the last four years, probably more so than eight, well, how long ago? Eight years ago. Yeah, it was, yeah. It's about, I mean, like, it wasn't, eight, yeah. well, maybe it was because I was younger, but I feel mm. like it wasn't as known. Like, I mm. feel like the girls having kids are a lot earlier. Yeah. Um, now, so yeah, that yeah. thought of abortion, yeah, it probably wasn't, raised that much within society yeah 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 so like i'd always just i guess it didn't cross my mind at the time like mind you in the past if i ever thought about like oh if i accidentally got a girl pregnant the first thing in my mind being a young guy is like no we'll just whatever like i don't want to deal with that type thing but when you're actually faced with that of you're 18 and your little kids in that girl's tummy yeah or belly you're like well shit what am i going to do like how am i going to take care of that child mm. that that was kind of my initial reaction i'm like yeah. holy shit what am i gonna do like mm. i just can't i didn't know what to do i was like fuck, like don't have work didn't have any money i didn't have money in my bank yeah i had a debt yeah <laughs> was, so who did you seek out to first to tell 
Um, the first person we told was her parents. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I wanted to tell them as well. Yeah. So that was something I wanted to face up to them to take responsibility for it. Mm. So just kind of just fast track a little bit. When she told me, the, my initial thing was obviously laughing. Holy shit! What are we going to do? Um, but very quickly, when she even when she was there, I decided, no, let's okay. Reality is you're pregnant. We were just together two weeks ago. Can we make this work? Like, let's try sure. and make this work. Yeah. Um, you know, because obviously as a, as a guy or anybody, you'd like to have your child grow up with the same two parents yeah. under the same roof. Because mm-hmm. it wasn't like I did for till age of 12. And it was always my what, like, desire to have that, like, you know, where they can grow up with the same parents. So yeah. let's try and make this work, whatever. So we got back together that day kind of thing. Um, but yeah, the first people we told were her parents. So we went over there and I was shitting myself. Like, I was so <laughs> nervous. I thought his, her dad was going to beat me, yeah. like, hard. I was, yeah, oh, I thought I was, was going to get flogged. Yeah. And um, I mean, we were just walking in there. I was like, my, I was actually shaking. My legs were shaking. I, like, I was sweating. And like, yeah. I'm like, they're like, we need to come tell you something. We took them into their room, shut the door. And I was like, I, I don't know how to say this, but I'm like, and, and she's pregnant. Like, your daughter's pregnant. And... Um, and her dad just put his hand, hands on his head. Oh no, oh no! Her mum started bursting into tears, oh. and then and then the dad started crying. Like I can't believe this. And then the mum's like, oh, like getting all cranky. I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like, but like, we're gonna try and make this work, and you know, we're gonna yeah. do all these things. Blah blah blah. Mm. Like we're gonna, it's gonna be okay. But and that was probably one of the scariest things I've had to do. I think I'm more like just laughing at just putting myself in your shoes of oh. the process. Oh man, yeah. like, it was anxiety. Oh, I was feeling so my stomach was sick oh, for yeah. days. That's, that, I wasn't you. laughing at the situation. Yeah. More like just how, I just picture you walking up the stairs. Oh my god, I've got to do it. Yeah. Oh, and we're sitting there too, and like do I do this? Oh, I've got to go into. Yeah. Get him into the room first, yeah. and even just have to, like we're gonna tell you something. Just even so, I'm sitting there just sweating. Over, like, what am I gonna say? How am we gonna do this? Like, I'm like, all right, let's just do it. And yeah, that was probably the one of the worst things we've had to do in my life. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy, so just man. to have to take responsibility for that. And what what happened after that? Yeah, so look, they pretty after about five minutes of you know the initial shock for them, they calmed down and they'll relax. I'm like, no, that's that's cool. Like, whatever. They're making jokes about it and they're like, oh, whatever. Like, you know, I guess. <laughs> They're like, oh, well, whatever, like, I guess, what can you do about it? I guess they were really happy um, being Christians that obviously we were just going to continue on as normal and try and wake things work and obviously have the child. Yeah. Um, so they were really happy about that as well. But, yeah. yeah, that was, it was okay after that. And then I told my parents, that was a lot easier of a process because they'd been through a lot with me where I told them, like, you know, where I've had house parties where people have thrown letterboxes through the windows and I had to tell them. So I've done a lot of bad things. Like, you know, I used to take my mum's car out at night in year nine, like, you know, mm-hmm. and drive around illegally, like, and do yeah. all these things. Um, so having to tell them that, oh, like, having a baby wasn't that difficult. Yeah, sure. So my parents were a little bit more okay with the initial reaction yeah. than hers. Yeah. So, I mean, my mum was just like, oh, my goodness, that's so exciting. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Like, really? Is that your reaction? Yeah, yeah. How was your relationship with your girlfriend's parents? Like, you obviously had yeah. a relationship with them before mm. you guys initially yeah, split. Yeah. What was it like? Really good. Yeah, yeah, we had a really good relationship because um, they're lo- lovely people yeah. really lovely um, so the relationship with them was great yeah, yeah. so um, yeah it was good yeah, they made it yeah. a lot easier than rather than yeah. like a one night stand oh, yeah. and having to try to explain at least you had a relationship with them yeah. and you knew the type of guy that mm. you were so I, like mm. I had dated her for two years yeah. up until when I told them so they'd, they'd gotten to know me like, yeah. like really well really well um, so I'd spent a lot of time over their house more so at their house than anywhere else we were at their house majority of the time so yeah yeah um they got to know me really well and all that so that was that was good that was a bonus for sure awesome yeah so once once you explained everything Mm. got it all off your chest um what what did you decide to do you were obviously going to keep it from the very beginning keep the child from the very beginning what was the process like during those next next nine months full on (laughs) full on eh? because i didn't have a job yeah and I was living at home. She was living at home. And I guess as a guy, I don't know if it's just probably more me or anything, but I'm like, oh, I need to provide. Like, yeah. I don't have any money to my name. I don't even have an income. Um, and I'm going to have to start taking care of a child now. Like, I'm going to, I need a job. Yeah. Um, I need a house too. Like, I need to live somewhere else out of my parents' house. Mm. Um, so for me, it was trying to figure out how to get a job and then in what. And I didn't know what, I just didn't even know what I was doing with my life. So, yeah. 
Um, but I ended up just calling a lot of builders. I just, I just thought, well, I was still a trade. Like, I'm heaps energetic and physically capable. So the easiest thing to do for me in my head was, like, I'll just get an apprenticeship. Like, yeah, sure, that's easy, whatever. And so I just called up a whole bunch of builders, like, hey, do you know anyone who needs an apprentice? Like, I just kept making phone calls to people I knew who knew other builders, got their numbers, called them up. Do you know? I wouldn't ask them directly, do you... Can do you, you have one? Or do you have? Would you like? Can I be your apprentice? But I said, do you know anybody? Yeah. Because then it would, they'd not feel so confronted by it. But anyway, the sure. first guy I called actually was like, actually, you know what? Yeah, I'll, I'll take you on. Because awesome. um, I'd explain yeah, like, yeah. hey, I'm like, I just got like, I, I'd explain the situation too. Like, I'm, I need a job. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah, just like yeah. I'm looking for an apprenticeship, and I really care. I'm like, no, no, like I need yeah. an apprenticeship. Like I'm, I'm work hard. Mm. Like, but I've got a kid on the way. Like I need yeah. a job. <laughs> probably would have helped as well. Mm. Knowing that, I mean, a lot yeah. of these guys probably have experienced similar things. Yeah. Not, not, not in terms of your situation, yeah. but they've got kids maybe, yes. and so they yeah. understand mm. the responsibility you're about yeah. to Absolutely. obviously come up with. Yeah. Um, so they can empathise, mm. empathise with that. So then. Um, yeah. Uh, how long did you stay in that for? Yeah, so work? got a job. I pretty much started a day like the, the next day after mm-hmm. I called him. Started. Um, and so I worked with him. So he was a local builder on the Central Coast as well. Really nice guy. Um, building like big architectural homes. And I stayed with him for two years. So I did nice. doing my apprenticeship, going to TAFE, all that thing. Yeah. Um, on a very, very low wage. And the thing was around at $308 or something like that. Um, and it did go up slightly in the second year, but it doesn't. It's not much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like three hundred eighty dollars, even four hundred dollars, it's like it's, yeah. it's, it's nothing. Yeah. Um, not for a family anyway. Yeah. But yeah, so stuck with him for two years, um, and then after that, the the paint. So obviously on job site, you got all your different trades: plumbers, yeah. painters, build electricians, all that. You build a relationship, you get to know them all, especially because mm. they're all the same trades. Yeah come on the same and job sites. So you're all doing every job there, yeah, just they're all their the, first call. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same company, everyone's same, like, yeah. yeah, especially for all, it was the same tradies, all real high quality, like, so you just got to know all of them, like, mm. classes, and you get to feel, like, it's a, it's actually, that's the one thing I, about the trade world, is everyone, like, it's real, like, tight knit, like, yeah. it's a, nice. it's a real, like, um, like, little club type thing. Yeah. Everyone yeah, knows awesome. each other, it's real, like, get around each other, everyone's, yeah, it's a good, good, um, Good thing, but yeah. So the painters, his painters, who would do all his paintwork for obviously the jobs he was building, um, I kind of got to know them a little bit. They were surfers, so I was surf as well. So we got along and talked about the surf mm. all the time. And I really liked them as well because they were really like relaxed yeah. type dudes. And um, I'd see them always like duck out for an hour at lunch and go for a surf and come back. And I'm like, oh, they're so lucky. Um, but they actually approached me one day and said, um, "Would you ever consider doing a painting apprenticeship?" We'd, like we've seen you work and you're a really hard worker like you always just go above and beyond all this type of thing mm. um you know would you like a job with us we'll pay more and blah 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 you know you got a family so i said sure so i started apprenticeship with them as well so i, fit, I stopped working with him which was he was cool with that um and then started working with them which were on the same sites with him sometimes too which was funny nice um but yeah so i got into them painting and so then i did did my apprenticeship pretty much finished that with them um and then that kind of led me to what about the age of 20, 23? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So by this stage, um, yeah, Adam, Adam was like three. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. So yeah, it was full absolutely. on. And how was how was bringing him up? How was how did it go? Was he an easy, easy yeah, kid? It, oh, but look, being a dad is probably like the f- most crazy experience ever. Like, so for that first nine months, you don't have anything going on inside you, so it's yeah. not really like a reality yet. Sure. Um, but that initial moment when they're born mm. is just crazy. Like, it changes you straight away. I'm is like, it just like, is it like something just comes out of you as yeah. you see a child? Yeah, it's, it is. It's literally like that. So, yeah, right. and, and it's gruesome. Like, like your heart just grows like 10 oh, yeah. larger. I'm like, oh my goodness, my whole life's about you now. Yeah, wow. <laughs> So, like, you know, when you're That's in the, cool. the birthing suite and it's the most crazy experience and there's a mess and it's just full on mm. and, like, it's the most gruesome thing you've ever seen and you see your little child's head pop out and... And you're like oh my goodness yeah. and um yeah when you, that initial reaction is like okay like my whole purpose now is to take care of you mm. like that's kind of the reaction and your whole life then becomes about them essentially absolutely um so funny. it's it's funny man like um you hear pretty much every parent say that and mm. jared and i are the same with mitch obviously yeah. we haven't experienced that yet yeah and yeah not for a while or we hope yeah. um but it, it sounds, it, it's the same answer across everyone who's been through it, is that you don't know what 
like what love is no. or what yeah. having a child is until you've actually experienced yeah. it. It's so, so yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. you just you do anything for them. Yeah, you know, like you think you love someone before we have kids. Have and you have a kid and you're like I would actually do anything for you yeah. like, I'd die I'd happily die for you happily do whatever I had to do mm. for you yeah. like what happens uh, what happens in the hardest of moments so like yeah. the tantrums like the, the diarrhea like the worst ones yeah. what is it still like you've still got that still unconditional love like yeah. it's torture but you've still yeah. got that weird is it a weird kind of feeling of it like is. love hate and, and especially too because I was so I was 18 when I found out she was pregnant 19 though when i actually when adam was born mm. and being 19 like i don't know it's just you got no idea i don't know how to be a dad i never i didn't yeah. read any books or like i wasn't even, i wasn't even ready to be a dad yeah, let alone yeah. had done research going like i'm ready like yeah so you, you don't even know how to handle all that stuff how do you handle tantrums how do you do nappies and walking and all these things and it was, for me it was just kind of like learn as i go like i was just kind of just yeah. constantly reacting to everything learning how this and that and mm. it was um yeah, in, look, in those moments when they're tantrums and the screaming and the crying, like, it's, yeah, it does your head in. Yeah. It's hard. It is hard. It's, look, having kids is probably the best thing ever, but it's probably the hardest thing ever as well. Like, it's probably the most, like, the most work. It is yeah. one of the hardest things to do, right. but it's also Absolutely. the most fulfilling sure. and um, amazing things you can experience, in yeah. what I reckon anyway. Um it's an incredible experience, but it's yeah. hard work. Absolutely, <laughs> for, I mean, for me anyway. At what, nineteen. What what can what can uh, what can compete against it? Really, mm -hmm. I mean, it's you, you can't if obviously if you're fully involved in it. Obviously, there's yeah. the stories where uh, someone leaves, they yeah. they bail. But when you're in it, it's yeah. like if I leave this kid at six months old for yeah. five minutes yeah. it will probably yeah. die yeah, so yeah, it's absolutely. it's like it's got your full attention yeah. all the time you've yeah. it's got your full love yeah. and um yeah it would just be it would just be a constant mm. so they're totally dependent on you absolutely. they come out literally incapable of doing anything <laughs> you have to feed That's them so bathe true. them wash them clean them just you have to do everything mm. do your work has it drop it uh at work being up late at night and having the baby yeah. crying, like yeah. fatigue, drain yeah. the whole It was time. the hardest, probably that first, especially like that first six months of a newborn is mm. the hardest. They're crying all the time. And, you know, especially working a trade too, you're up early, come home, you're working physically all day, yeah. then you're straight into like baby duties. You don't have a whole lot of time for yourself as well. Mm. And, and then you just drained. Like I was pretty much just running in overdrive all the time, just constantly just trying to get through every day mm. <laughs> every day so it was a struggle that's crazy yeah. man and, and, and it's just i think too it's being young that was the heart like sure. look being young had its benefits having a lot more energy than say someone at 30 35 yeah being 19 like you're in your prime of like you're mm. just bursting with energy yeah yeah but i, I was still drained i'm Absolutely. like how do parents who are older do this <laughs> and then you quickly have to shut out and obviously we talked about you were a little bit more premature when you did the drugs and alcohol mm. and whatnot. <coughs> as soon as that baby come, was that whole boys life and there for the boys and going out, that just completely just died? Did yeah, it not? just dropped off. Yeah. It just fell away because basically my whole life and world revolved around work mm -hmm. and family. There's almost no time for anything else and um, even just struggling to find time for friends. It was just... It was hard. Like, But at the same time, that whole world of drinking drugs kind of was just by default kicked out because for me anyway I, like I wanted to be an amazing father like I wanted to be a good dad like I'm like okay well I want to be committed and like just in this and I want to roll my whole life around my family now mm -hmm. and I don't have time for those things type so that's kind of where it changed especially once I found out Adam was going to be born yeah. I made a decision that's it like I'm cleaning my life up I'm getting a job I'm going to get a place mm -hmm. I'm going to start preparing for a family so yeah. I can take care of them yeah yeah when did um when did your health and fitness yeah. uh, start to come into your life? So I've always kind of been into the gym mm -hmm. from probably the age of 14. But so not so much health. Sure. <laughs> um, at just 14. pumping iron. <laughs> yeah, just pumping weights. That time. And it yeah. really started around, um, you know, being in school. I was always referred to as the skinniest, littlest dude. Like, right. So, so being in school, like, constantly being referred to as tiny and little and skinny. Like, I hated it. 
And um, so about the age of 14, I'm like, that's it. I'm going to the gym. I think I watched Pumping Iron or something. I don't yeah, know. Like, nice. <laughs> I think every guy who goes yeah, yeah. watched that at some point. <laughs> but yeah, so I watched Pumping Iron. I'm like, that's it. I want to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, I want to get muscle yeah. like that. And so I didn't know, I had any idea about nutrition training. Like, I just thought you must lift weights and get massive. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so I went at 14. I've always just been interested in putting, you know, get going to the gym, getting muscles. All that. I just loved it. I think what I really loved about it was just the outlet. So you can go there and how good you feel mm. when you get in there and yeah. like smash out like a really high intense workout um, where you all your endorphins are rushing. I think yeah. I just got addicted to that feeling. Cool. So that was that's kind of like where I got introduced to fitness was I just yeah. I was just so sick of being called skinny. So I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go put on as much weight as possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did that have to come to a halt when when Nietzsche was born? Yeah, when Adam was born. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. So I still kind of fit it in but nowhere near as much as I used to just trying to squeeze in 20 minute workouts yeah yeah just uh, I'd try and go in the afternoons but then um, you know my wife at the time would get cranky at me because I'd be out and then sit at home um, so then I'd try to do it really early in the morning before work which was just cr- like really difficult especially mm-hmm. when you start at 7 yeah, so you'd you at least have to get to the gym four. yeah like you got to get to the gym at 5.30 which yeah, means yeah. you're up at 5 maybe or quarter to 5 which when you got kids too it's like you wake oh, up and you're just man. like oh like it's full on yeah, so yeah. yeah that definitely suffered a little bit but eventually when they get a little bit older you can fit in more time for that yeah try and work you got to just work out a routine what works yeah whether it's mornings i, I ended up fitting it in the mornings mm-hmm. got into i kind of got used to it. i still have never really gotten used to early morning at the gym yeah. but yeah you do just you do what you got to do yeah, yeah yeah sure yeah so let's dive into when finance uh, yeah. came into your life well, what was the transition from the, yeah. the trading so to massive finance massive change in worlds mm-hmm. because the trade world is just the total opposite of what I do now yeah. um, but for me I guess the biggest thing is because I've always been so driven by family that was kind of my biggest thing between, like, and it still is now is what really drives me to achieve and to try and accomplish my dreams and goals is, is to provide a life for my family but like just a, a, but a a whole nother next level type life yeah um so the trade was kind of that was to get me through so that my whole thing was i just need a job i just need some income i need cash flow um i didn't know what i wanted to do so i just thought well, get a trade like it's good good skills learn some good good Soft stuff the, uh, yeah, just a trade. yeah it's a good yeah, fallback for a lot of guys it's just yeah get a trade fall into it. it's like whatever you don't need to really know anything going into it no. you just kind of jump on some tools and do some things smoke um, is cool yep smoke is good whatever <laughs> yeah Let's it was good it. so like it was good to fall in that but all along too like i just noticed that you know i start when you get into the trade you just get the money but then i started wanting to learn about well what's the guy above me getting what about the builder how much does he earn mm. um you know what is my future going to look like that's kind of where i started to go after about six months a year initially with carpentry and then in painting and you know after you spend a lot of time around them you start to hear about their income and the money and this and that and um for me it was kind of like in the trade world um and this is just something more personally for me that you know i've always kind of wanted to achieve a lifestyle probably above ordinary okay something that's like a whole nother level of financial freedom etc um and so when I was in painting, I, my two, I had two bosses. One was 10 years older than me. The other one was 20 years older than me. And um, they always seemed to complain about money and their income. Mm. Like it was always just like, oh, it's just never enough money. Yeah. And I guess being like 10 years younger than my, one of my bosses and then 20 years younger, it kind of, I, I always step back and go, hang on, like these two guys, 10 years, 20 years older than me, like they're, they're constantly saying how much... They're like, oh, so over this, blah, blah, blah. Like, they just weren't happy. Mm. Not to say that I couldn't be happy doing that job, but most of their unhappiness came around the, the kind of financial ceiling that you hit or that yeah. they'd hit. Yeah. Um, and so I guess I didn't really, like, I didn't really look into if you could actually increase the financial ceiling in the trade world. But I just thought, you know what? Maybe I need to get into another industry mm-hmm. which has a whole lot less financial ceilings as far as the type of income ceiling that you can get to. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to get into business of some sort outside of the trade world because I kind of thought you were, unless you became some massive construction company, you were limited by the amount of jobs you can complete each year. That yeah, was sure. that would dictate your income. Yeah. Like whether it's painting, well, you can only paint a certain amount of homes a year. Mm. Yeah. And you can quote for those homes. And that's what you can end up with in a year. Mm. If you want more money, you've got to paint more homes, yeah. which means more time. So you're just paid off time, really. Yeah, all staff. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So it's it's um, I kind of thought mm, maybe this isn't for me. 
maybe I should get into something more like business wise. Um, mm. And so it was, it was funny because it was actually a guy that I had two ideas. So because my dad was in financial planning, right? Um, which I thought I probably could never do that. So it's not me. My mind's not like that. Like I kind of really undervalued myself as well, especially going through a trade. You kind of dumb yourself down a little bit. You think you're dumb. I don't yeah. know. I did anyway, especially failing school. Okay. Um, but so the two options for me was I was either going to go into like supplements because I loved still like the health and fitness mm. industry and I thought maybe I could get into supplements, own supplement brand, all that type of thing and see how that like create a business around that business model. Um, kind of what like NextGen has done on the, the coast. Yeah, of course. Um, or it was see if I can get a job with my dad in just admin and see if I can just slowly work my way up in there. Yeah. Study. And I didn't know though if I was capable of doing any of that yet. Um, but I, so I thought that out for a while. Then, may, then I actually spoke to my dad. I'm like, hey, what do you think about giving me an admin job? Um, just do, you know, doing whatever you want me to do, like just paying me the same I'm getting now in the like, apprentice type thing. Um, so he's like, mm, okay, sure. Like he was a little bit like, mm, okay. But yeah, eventually gave me a job. So that was kind of like my foot in the door to the industry, mm-hmm. but I had no skills, no qualifications. Like, and I'd come from a world that was all about physical labor, mm-hmm. not mental not thinking all that type of thing so it was a massive shock to me the first three months just sitting down being in an office with numbers figures maths all that type of thing yeah um but i started studying um financial planning diploma advanced diploma all that so that's kind of where i started studying but after the first three months i started loving it and i started to really understand what what the actual job and role is of a financial Mm -hmm. planning business yeah which is really just to help people achieve their financial goals sure. that's kind of our main purpose yeah and i think that's another reason why i wanted to do something different was i wanted to do something like that really made a difference in people's lives as well mm. so it wasn't all just about money it was also about okay like painting great right? and i saw like that it made people happy like you paint the house oh goodness it's amazing mm. but i'm like it for me it wasn't like i didn't see it as it made a huge impact and change in their lives Meaningful. yeah and i wanted something really fulfilling as well um and so for the first three months in here, I saw actually how much we were impacting people's lives, how much money we were saving them, how much better off they were before and then after our advice. Yeah. Um, and so I really started to love that. And then that's when I started studying, started learning it all, which was a massive shock for me as well because coming from failing school, going to studying finance was just massive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I had no prior knowledge or background to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got through it, actually started to excel at it really well. Nice. Um, started to achieve a lot, pass everything. Like I passed all of it, like 100%, just my, like boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Um, that was, what was really hard about that time was that I was still at a family and I had to work full time during the day in admin and then study at night by correspondence. Yeah, wow. So I was kind of like, it was like a real hustle time because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was at work all day. Mm. Then I got the family, the whole kids yeah, screamed. By this yeah. time, Alex had come along as well, my youngest son. Mm. So I had two kids now, two boys, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> come home to them, they're nuts, going crazy, play with them, blah, 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 and then have dinner, put them to bed, all that type of thing. And then from like 8 o'clock till 10, 11, sometimes midnight, I'd be studying. Mm. And I'd do that constantly every day, getting through these courses. So that was like a really intense time as well. But yeah. I knew that, okay, this is an industry that I can apply myself, yeah. where it I could see a real long-term future in it. And you knew the short-term sacrifice, the long-term. Yeah, 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 exactly. So for me, I'm like, okay, this is going to suck for two years or for, you know, that period of time that I'm studying three years. Yeah. But at the end of it, it's going to give me the opportunity to do something that's extremely fulfilling, impact people's lives, change people's lives, interact with everyday Australians, Mm. as well as give me the opportunity to increase income to then take care of my family, which was the main driver behind increasing income Mm. was I wanted to give my family more than they needed and then be able to give back to other people as well so that's kind of it's interesting man it's a um it's kind of a rare outlook on the work that Mm. your motivating factor was to help people to help your own family Mm. not not have money to buy the nice things and live in that materialistic Mm. world even though i'm sure that that has been a byproduct yeah and they're all nice they're they're great things to have but they're just things absolutely you know they're not fulfilling things absolutely and a lot of people a lot of people work that out after the fact yeah. after the money comes it's like like i just bought this car like why don't i just why aren't i successful why yeah. don't i feel and it's good it's awesome that you had that insight yeah. before and it sounds like you picked it up quite naturally as well did it do you, yeah. is that being that your dad was in that field is that something that he always spoke about 
when you saw him beforehand? Did he, did he kind of keep work and personal separate? Yeah, he did actually. Okay. Yeah, so I didn't really ever have, a, to be honest, because he's done this my entire life. Yeah. And I had no idea what he did. I just, mm. I, still, even when I was in school, I didn't yeah, know what he was doing. He just goes to work and comes home. I didn't know what he actually <laughs> did at work. Yeah, I, I knew, it, and I didn't even know, like, this is how far detached I was from his life. Was I didn't even know what he did every day. I knew he was a financial planner, and I had zero mm. idea of what that was. Yeah. I didn't know he sat down with people every day. Mm. Like, I didn't know that he was dealing with lots of pe- people's money and yeah. coming out with plans. I had no idea about that stuff. Mm. Um, but, yeah, and so he didn't go into too much of it. But basically, being in the environment, like being in the office, um, and then, you know, sitting in on his appointments, actually seeing what he's doing, I'm like, this is amazing. Like, we're, we're, and I, we were with some, a few other advisors as well when I first started. But you kind of see they were kind of at the point in life where they didn't really, they didn't have that care anymore. Mm-hmm. It was just kind of a job, you know, like we're, we're in a job where if you care, you can make a massive difference. It can be really fulfilling or it can just be a job. Or you can be Absolutely. lazy. You can just be lazy, yeah. turn up, whatever, sit down with somebody, do your standard thing and not yeah. really care about it. You can still help them. But, you know, if you go above oh, that, and beyond, yeah, yeah go that extra beyond. mile. So. And it's funny, it's funny how obvious um the success of a business is mm. when that's the case yeah. and uh you've got someone mm. say like he or like you who has mm. that and the the business runs successfully yeah. and then you've got um the opposite end of the spectrum where you've got people who are just greedy and care about the money yeah. and want people in in and out yeah. and they fail whether it's in the short term or the long term yeah. they eventually die out yeah. and it's funny how it's funny how um the authenticity will always win, yeah, always win in that case. So how long now have you been in the, the financial planning? So been? in the industry, four years. Mm-hmm. As a financial planner, a year. Yeah. Yeah. But interestingly enough, for the first nine months of being a financial planner, I didn't make one sale or yeah. one client, for example. So like imagine going to like start. So starting a business and not getting one client for nine months. Yeah. You're still on a salary in that phase, but, and then there's yes. a bonus. Yeah, so it was on a salary um, as a financial planner, just getting my standard salary each week. Yeah, yeah. and then you can get your commissions based on your salary. If I got a client, yeah. which I didn't get any, yeah. zero. So yeah, I pretty much right. made no change financially from being in office manager admin to yeah. being a financial planner. There was no income increase. What was your What was your focus and your priorities in those in those nine months then? Um, I just got lazy, got okay. really lazy. Yep. I think too, because I'd done so much study, done all this work, mm, I thought that, that by it. doing it, and once I, so basically you do all the study, then you have to apply mm. through the licenses. Our industry is highly, highly regulated. Right. So like, just to get into the industry as a financial planner, you've got to have all the qualifications, and then you've also got to apply through your licensee, um, which takes like nine weeks of background checks, financial background checks, criminal checks, like they do a full rundown of your entire life history mm. to see if you're a fit, to you know, to come, yeah, yeah, to provide advice, right? And then um, getting into that, I thought, fine, like I'll just do all that, and then I'll just get clients, like it'll just happen yeah, magically. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought, like, because I saw <laughs> saw my dad do it, yeah, I saw how easy the clients just flowed, and how easy he could yeah. just speak to him and get all these appointments and sales and and all of that. Um, I thought it just just kind of fall in my lap, and it didn't for nine months. Nothing happened. Yeah. I was like, maybe I can't do this, and then I'm like, well, maybe I got to call people, but then I was too shit scared to do that. And so I really just started to even doubt whether I could do the job at sure. all. What if, changed? Um, <laughs> what changed is really interesting. So probably about nine, so nine months into it. Um, is how, about, how long from now? Was that, that was, that was so last year. Oh, no, okay. so no, no, it was this year. Sorry, yeah. this year in June. That's when it changed. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so um, so I was still, do, but my role was when I became financial planner was still office manager. So I was just managing all the staff, getting all the work done behind the scenes type yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but then become a financial planner, I'm like, okay, well, now I need to see clients, et cetera, like that. Um, but what changed was I was pretty much ready to say, like, I think I'll just stay office manager and don't want to be an advisor. It's not for me. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've got the balls to sit in front of clients and actually help them. Like, it's a really, I don't know about for yourself and what you guys do, but to sit down in front of people you don't know and all of a sudden just start training them or whatever, like, yeah. or giving them advice on their money and sitting yeah. down, especially one-on-one, like it's, you're in this like, it's this one-on-one space where they're like, okay, so tell me about yourself. And they've got to tell you all these things. Like, and you've got to ask questions like, what's in your bank? Mm. How much money? How much income are you making? Like, all these really like confronting questions. Mm, yeah. You've got to ask them all. I was really scared and nervous of that. Yeah. Um, and also, too, when it came time to say, okay, cool, so we can do all this work for you as well. And this is what my charge is to do it all for my service. 
just like any other job, like your trade, this is what it costs for me to do this work for you. I was scared that I wasn't valuable enough. Absolutely. That like, why would they want to pay me? I'm so young too. Like I'm 25. Why would they want to, like these people I'm sitting down in front of like 60, why would they want to listen to mm, a 25 yeah. year old? So I really doubted myself and my own capabilities. And often those hard questions are the ones that get you the sales are maybe different, but I don't know for myself. Mm. They're the questions that open them up to their deepest vulnerabilities, which mm. then makes them obviously want to yeah. work with you. If yes. you can get those deepest vulnerabilities, oh, like I'm running on in this much, yeah. you get those deepest vulnerabilities yes, out. Absolutely. If you, if you come underneath the surface, yeah. then yeah, well, here, I've actually got a game plan. Yeah. This is the game plan. They're like, sweet. And if they can admit the problem yeah. to themselves, yeah. then it's pretty much game over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's kind of what I struggled with for those nine months. Yeah. Um, but what all changed was I was actually just scrolling through. Um, I think my main, my biggest block was self-doubt in my own abilities and knowledge in what I knew about how to help people yeah. <laughs> financially. So I really had a lot of doubt in myself and my own capabilities. And then also, I didn't believe in sales as well. So I just thought that sales was something that's dirty. Like, because our industry, like our job's not sales necessarily, but we do have to sit down with somebody and say, okay, would you like to go ahead with our service? Yeah. Which means we're asking them, would they like to purchase our service, yeah, which yeah. is a sale. So, Absolutely. but I just thought that selling was a really kind of dirty thing it was yeah. a real like mm, sales is you know, really it's shady pretty, yeah, yeah. yeah it's just shifty you know I, I kind of just thought of car salesmen i thought of all these things where yeah. sales was viewed as dirty and i had a real bad mindset on what sales is or what my job was or how to actually convince something somebody to do something that's in actually in their best interest um so i was actually scrolling through and i saw this paid promotion of this guy who did sales and he actually spoke on this short video of how to um how sales should actually be viewed and actually, if you're a genuine good person, sales is the best thing because you actually get to convince somebody and show them of how... Are you helping them? Yeah, well, how to help them. And that, hey, doing this is actually in your best interest. Mm. Yeah. You know, let me help you. Absolutely. So I didn't view it like that. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, man. It's funny. Um, I have... I th- look, I think majority of people have that fear as well. I battled a lot within my own business mm. of valuing your own work and yeah. and you make the comparisons and you say, well, the guy down the road, he's charging yeah. that, but he's been in the industry for 20 years yeah. and and it's hard when there's maybe not an industry standard, but it's <clears> kind of like a free for yeah. all yeah. kind of thing, which which some industries are and some industries are. Yes. Um, but I, I learned a very similar thing and, and obviously authenticity is the yeah. first thing, yeah. but you've got um, two main rules that I learned was um, they are um, you're doing them a disservice mm-hmm. by not giving them Absolutely. your service um, by not offering it yeah. and people won't do uh, if they don't pay for something yeah. they're less likely to take action on it yeah. so, so yeah. you think about yeah. you buy you buy a car for 20,000 yeah. or you buy a car for 80,000 yeah. um, you you're gonna the way yeah the way you value it yeah, is incredibly right. different yeah, yes. and um, especially when it comes to things that can make people an ROI a car's a very bad example yeah. but financial planning yeah. marketing yeah. like all of this kind of yeah. stuff if you're bringing them that positive return yes. you're doing them a disservice by not by yeah. them not engaging exactly. in your services mm, yeah. so that's yeah. something I picked up real quick mm. um, was that and basically when I saw that post um, actually, he had a whole bunch of books, and I read nice. about two of his books over the weekend. That weekend, it was a Friday I saw, it, and I was like, ready to throw in the towel on the whole thing. What was his name? Uh, Grant Cardone. Oh, yeah. Grant so he's, Cardone. So he's, he's pretty he's out there. Dude. He's yeah, pretty sure. full on. He's yeah. got some pretty interesting ideas and theories. Yeah. I don't necessarily agree with all of them, sure. but what I do love about him is his energy and passion yeah. towards wanting to help. Have you done any of his courses? Or I haven't done any of his courses, books, but I've read a lot of his books, too. a lot of his videos, a lot of his YouTube's, um, yeah. all that. But I read his his book the first book I read was Sell or Be Sold okay and it's all about sales and he yeah. kind of pretty much reprogrammed my mind reading that book reprogrammed to go actually you know what my whole job is to help people mm-hmm. so like I actually need to show them that I can help them yeah absolutely and close that like and there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing bad about that it's actually in their interest for me mm-hmm. to to get that sale yeah um, so pretty much after that weekend I was like did like a full immersion in sales and like reading all these books and materials and come Monday I came back in the office and I just kept making phone call after phone call nice. to all these clients or potential clients like prospects saying hey can we catch up I think I could really help you blah 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 so I just kept making phone call after phone call and I ended up booking an appointment after appointment after appointment 
And then I remember my first time going out sitting like I was so shit scared, like yeah. coming out the front door of this house, I should hear my legs were shaking. I was sitting on a table like, you, you know, you can hear the voice, you, you know, when you feel your voice is all shaky and you're like yeah, choking yeah. up and I'm getting all anxious. And, yeah. but you know, I just kept doing it over and over again, kept calling people, kept calling it. Yeah. And um, yeah, just kept getting, got sale after sale after sale, kept helping all these people. And I started loving it. I'm like, oh my goodness, mm-hmm. like I get to help people like, and they're loving it. Like they're happy. Yeah. Uh, making a difference all those things so um i pretty much in a month just like saw stacks of clients like all in one month like it was just intense like um time wow. period yeah just recently so after in june july august just kept doing the same thing making phone getting on the phone um and meeting up with clients every day and then i just started promoting more and then clients would talk to other clients you know referrals and sure. then i just started doing the instagram thing which which is hard because like young people um aren't as engaged necessarily with finance yeah but with good reason because it's really like it's usually really expensive to have financial advice mm-hmm. like there's ways you can pay for it you can pay for it out of your superannuation or et cetera, blah blah blah, okay. blah which sometimes helps for young people yeah um but it's still expensive so that's something i'm currently still trying to work mm. to find a way to give yeah, financial really, advice really interesting because uh in that it was one of the key questions that i wanted to ask was the troubles that you went through as a, uh, as a kid growing up, mm. does, do you have a really soft spot for our boys that we're talking to, our demographic, that age group, yeah. that 16 Massive. to 30 year old age mm. group? And if you can provide them um, a little bit of advice on their financial, uh, financial side of things um, mm. from planning, you know, we'd love to hear any, and I'm sure the boys listening would love to hear some of your best tips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. It's hard because there's so many. Yeah, <laughs> and it's so like um, the thing about financial advice as well is it is so specific yeah, to people's personal yeah. circumstances. Because there's no like one tip for all. Mm. Um, we don't have a tar. They've left school. They've got yeah. into a trade. Yeah. Um, okay. Put it back to this way. You've got all the advice from a financial perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what would you say to yourself if you have to give yourself a tip when you're 18, 19? Yeah. When you first Stop spending, eh? Stop spending. Yeah. Stop spending. <laughs> That'd be my first tip. Yeah. Save, like, live like shit. That'd be, like, I know it sounds terrible, mm-hmm. but I, I see clients, and the young, so the young clients I see, their biggest reason for seeking help is debt. Yeah. is debt or they can't manage their, their budget they yeah. can't manage their cash flow yeah. mm-hmm. I don't really find that it's a problem with the clients who are um, say 35 plus yeah. they seem to have a lot higher of an income a lot more assets yeah. but I see clients all the time and occasionally on Instagram I'll offer just some like one on one free I do like occasionally I'll just go like get all these people message me okay. and I'll pick one go and see them and help them but pretty much nine times out of ten it all revolves around debt mm. so the number one thing I'd say to the young person or myself back when I was 18 is stop spending like live within your means like you have yeah, to live yeah. within your break means break down what you're earning and look yeah. at and go you know yeah. what yeah. where do I actually want to go and yeah. what am I putting towards that? yeah exactly you're going to like I think it's really hard and I think social media doesn't help with these lifestyles that are on there and the e-com world now yeah retarget someone and there you go there's another online purchase on an online store yeah, yeah. Mm. so I think that's probably for young people is the biggest thing is cash flow management yeah. is learning how to manage your cash flow I think if you can learn that you're gonna you're gonna be really successful yeah. in, in actually creating more wealth later in life because mm. you know it, um, I think cash flow yeah and, and debts trying to stay out of the bad debts um, because they can really drag you down throughout yeah. those those 20 to 30 you know 20 to 30 kind of mark even yeah. even you can't really get into debt at 16 because you're not allowed to but you know sure. from 18 to yeah, 30 yeah. you just you really need to ma- learn how to cash flow yeah yeah and it's it's exciting too when you go oh, i remember the first time i stepped into a bank when i started my um my second business which in itself was a stupid choice um it was going in and being like yeah i want to i want to loan it was only for three thousand yeah. dollars but it was to buy some <clears> gear and I just thought, like, looking back at that now, I'm just like, why would I buy a loan to get gear yeah. um, when I've got no money, yeah. I've got barely any clients, yeah. and it just wasn't, it just wasn't the right choice. But I've, I know for myself, I've struggled. I've struggled hard over over the years as as the business builds up, you see a yeah. lump sum come in, yeah. and it's like, Boom. great, that's like that's yeah. like a big lump of cash, and you're just like. Sweet, now I get to spend it. Yeah, let's go get some things I like. Yeah. Yeah, There's kind of things I, I like. And, and I, I, I spend money 
personally, I spend money on stuff that improves myself or my business, yeah, but I'm still spending the money. Yeah, I'm yeah. still spending the money that I should be putting elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, it, it's a better way to use it, mm. but the yeah, the, there's no systems in place yeah, for, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and you get in trouble with the tax man at the end of the year yeah. and then you start pay as you go payments and you're like, shit, like two grand, like seriously, like what's the go here? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, an, it's a very interesting, yeah. it's a very interesting time that a lot of people get caught in. Our age demographic and the boys listening, you know, can, could relate, but it's like who can have the best you now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who can have the most add-ons? Who can have the most pampers? Uh, yeah. yeah. So I guess what we want to do is, where can these boys like reach out to find you from a social media perspective? Oh, so from social media perspective, Instagram. Yep. Just and, and um, what's, your, what's your username? I think it's Nick Hone underscore. Yep. Yeah. So N I C K H O N E underscore. We probably tag so, it in the in yeah the yeah. Podcast, but so yeah, you reach out to me there. I often post things about it. Um, but yeah. yeah, send us a message, whatever you want. Yeah, um, for sure. I loved. It doesn't cost anything to meet with me. So that's one thing. I don't think I, like I try and let people know, but to sit down with me and have a chat for an hour costs nothing. Awesome. Yeah, and, and so I'd love, um, you know, for these boys to be able mm, to reach out with you. And yeah, like, absolutely. You know what? You know, this is where I'm in. This is the yeah. position I'm in. Where's a little yeah. bit of advice I yeah. can get? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. And, you know, as you, seems like you're on a bit of a, you've got this idea that you want to, you may want to mention that talking about making financial mm. uh, planning uh, an easy cost. Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. And, you know, as you develop... However, you want to go around yeah, that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of boys reaching out mm. for financial advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love for our listeners, viewers to even you know hit you up through social media, yeah. catch up with you, and sure. talk about how they can put themselves in a position where they can enjoy life as much as possible. Yeah. You know, yeah. have a little bit of like um, ownership. Yeah. And go, you know what? Where do I see myself in five, six, seven, eight, yeah. nine, mm. ten yeah. years? And yeah. where do I want to be myself when I have a kid? You know, exactly. in what position? Yes. Yeah. I guess you'd hate to see anyone go through the position of, you know, three hundred and eighty dollars a week looking after their first yeah, child. It's hard. It's, hard. Yeah, yeah, it's a hard it's position. Tough. It's tough work. Mm. Yeah. And it's it's key to understand too is that obviously your your services are to make people's lives better. Yeah. And so so and to essentially give a positive ROI yeah. on finance specifically, yes. but life. Yeah. And so I think that was one thing that always scared me was making investments whether it's in my business in any area whether it's marketing or um, equipment or anything that that is going to cost me money the it's scary because you think you're losing money but yeah. what what people don't realize is that you spend money to make money yeah, so yeah. it's the, the classic yeah. quote yeah. but for for guys to go in or anyone to go into someone like yourself yeah. that one piece of advice from that and it could come from that one free consultation yeah, so yeah, they're not absolutely. spending any money yeah, one right. piece of advice to to push them uh, on a route for the next twelve months, yeah. compounded over that time to save fifty bucks. Yeah, yeah. like it's a long day <laughs> into a, into yeah, an interest account. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So um, I think the last thing that we want to finish mm-hmm. with is um, we do a finish question with our guests. Yep. Is the age you are now? Yeah, of all your life experiences that yep. you've gone through, which you know you've gone through a hell of a lot from mm. the break up your parents to yep. being yep. involved in drugs. Um, to not really knowing what you want to do, career changes, everything like that. In the age you are now, with all the experiences that you've got to gain, you can go back to your, in your case, your 15, 16, to your premature self. What would be the one piece of advice? Oh, that's tough. Yeah. You would give yourself from a life, not a financial perspective. Yeah, no, no, a just life, a life, yeah. A life perspective. Yeah, that's a tough one. So many. Um, I think... How would the conversation go? I think the biggest thing for me, if I was to have a conversation with myself, 16 or 21 years old, in that that period, is to to invest in yourself, like to educate yourself. Mm. Um, Mm. Not necessarily to spend. You don't have to go spend money to educate yourself. You know, but it's to to learn as much as possible. To learn to grow your mind. I think is. You can't put a value on that. No. Like yeah. the, it's free. It's Google, free. Google's right yeah. there. Videos, yeah. YouTube. How many people are putting out content for free now oh, on, on about mindset yeah. and learning? And it's just, there's so much available content. And even in books, I mean, you don't have to go spend thousands of dollars on a course. You can buy a book for $10 sometimes. Yeah. Um, 
and have the greatest minds. And have yeah, and I so I think going back to that young age, and it's hard because when you're in that age, mm. reading might not be a thing. But there's other ways you can learn. Yeah. But it's I would learn as much as possible, and I'd invest back in yourself, mm. in your education, in your what you can learn as much as possible. That'd be my biggest tip. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. yeah. awesome, man. Um, thanks so much for coming on, Nick. You're you're a legend. I hope that people now flood in your gates. Um, but I mean, yeah, no, everyone's got a whole bunch. I've gained a lot from from today. So thanks so much for for being a part and, of it. Um, yeah, boys, make sure you jump on and find Nick and yeah, catch up. up with him and um, just talk yeah. about your uh, your future. With yeah, your send us a message.